Hi everyone. Welcome to this second online panel. It's uh, as part of our global entrepreneurship uh, summit series. Uh, this year the global entrepreneurship summit is being held in Hyderabad in India and along with the US consulate and she the people we've been hosting a series of activities. This is the second online panel and we have a stellar lineup of incredible women who have uh, been addressing sexual violence through technology. So I'm going to hand over uh, the the mic to Holly. She's the founder of Stop Street Harassment. Hi everyone and thank you Elsa. <clears throat> Of course, then my throat gets all clogged up the second I'm talking. Um, as Elsa said, I'm the founder of Stop Street Craftsman, and I'm an author of three books and more than 80 articles on gender-based violence issues, particularly in public spaces. And I've also um, done consulting work for UN Women's Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces Global Initiative. And um, the first project I did with UN Women in 2013, 2014 is really relevant to our panel. Um, across that year, I was part of a research project that examined whether or not women had access to mobile phones, and if so, if they used those phones to prevent, document, or respond to sexual harassment and other forms of sexual violence. So before we hear from the panelists, I just wanted to touch on the main findings to show the context within which these apps are um, have been produced. So first, even having access to a mobile, mobile phone is gendered. Um, in our research and from a literature review of studies on the topic, all over the world, men were either slightly or much more likely, <clears throat> excuse me, than women um, to have access to uh, mobile phones, uh, particularly to have sole ownership of them. So um, this was particularly true in low income households and for older women. So in those households, um, women may actually only have access to a shared phone and only occasionally. Further, even when a woman did have her own phone, it was often purchased for her by a man and or a man in her family or you know, a husband, someone was paying for her ongoing phone bill costs. Um, and this is true across all regions in the world. So thus taking these two points into account, we know that women who want to use their mobile to document or report sexual harassment may face challenges from the start and that they may not always have access to the mobile when they need it. Um, and when they do, the man who purchased it may monitor their use, making the woman feel less comfortable using it for this purpose. The research also showed other barriers to women using mobile phones in relation to sexual harassment and abuse. And these barriers include one, a lack of awareness about what constitutes sexual harassment, especially in the public spaces context. People were much more aware and familiar of um, domestic violence and rape, for instance, but not of sort of the day-to-day -day sexual harassment that so many women experience. Um, two, the idea of using a mobile in this way was just new, period. Um, and then three, people were wary of taking out their mobile at the time of their harassment incident for fear of retaliation or abuse. And lastly, most people did not see the police as allies or places of support, so they didn't see the point of using a mobile to make a report. So at the time of my research, there were already uh, many apps that existed to address gender-based violence, but most of them focused on domestic violence or intimate partner relationships. Um, and due to the barriers just mentioned, very few people were utilizing these apps. So even though my research was conducted a few years ago, this is largely the same context in which our panelists are working. Uh, most people are not clear on exactly what sexual harassment is or how to use their mobile phones to address it. And there are demographics of women who do not have easy or secure access to a mobile phone. And yet the apps developed by our panelists are having an impact and are helping many people. Um, so I think that it's even more exciting and important knowing um, the work that they're doing given this context um, and knowing just how crucial it is to try to reach women in particular who um, you know, who need these resources. So that said, let's hear from them um, on what they're doing. So I'll introduce each panelist before she speaks and then ask um, each panelist to share a few brief points about their app, um, you know, what it is, how it came about. And then after they each present about four or five minutes, um, I'll ask a few questions before opening it up for you um, to ask your questions. But um, actually, in fact, if you have a question that comes to you as you're hearing from the panelists, please feel free to put it into the chat um, and then I'll see that um, when the Q&A time comes. 
So first up, we're going to have Kirthi Jayakumar, um, and she is an artist, activist, actor, and writer in, based in India. And she founded and runs the Red Elephant Foundation. So over to you. Thank you, Holly. Um, so as, as part of the Red Elephant Foundation, one of the things that we do is to work on gender equality through civilian peace building and through education of young people. But with time when we brought in Chennai, a space that hasn't yet been tapped so far, we came to understand that a lot of people were in need of resources. So it was in the back of our mind to create an access space where survivors could actually go, uh, free without any invasions in their privacy and access information, but it wasn't something we got down to until last year. So a friend of mine had survived an abusive marriage after having moved out of India first time in her life spending 15 months in captivity, virtual captivity. Her husband of that time used to virtually imprison her inside the household, um, prevent her from moving out. He used to um, physically abuse her, leave her with a lot of all kinds of um, physical and sexual abuse uh, impacts. Uh, finally, she mustered the courage and left the house and tried to reach out to many of us, by which time it was already night in India. Most of us were asleep, and when I say us, it was her friends. She couldn't reach out to her family, she couldn't reach out to her parents, because both of them were heart patients, and giving them a call at night and waking them up with this would mean putting them in a bit of danger. So not being able to reach out to my friend, to respond to her and give her the information she needed, especially when she trusted me, made me feel horrible. And that made me realize that a piece of technology that can actually curate information for survivors on where to go, what to do next, what kind of help can you find, especially if you're outside your home country or you're even your home city, it can be incredibly valuable. Having worked with Elsa and with Safe City as a partner in different social media platforms, um, I also came to realize that they were doing some anomalous work by visualizing the data perfectly. And for a survivor, to be able to access data, it had to be visually easy to capture and really access on a, a spur of a moment. So I borrowed the idea of using a crowd map, but this time, instead of mapping the actual incidents of violence, I started mapping resources. So that meant that a survivor who was reporting um, an incident could also use another map to find resources in that area itself. So we're not just receiving information of reports on, on all the instances of violence, but we're also helping them find responses to it. So with time, I came to realize that only few women are going to be able to actually use a browser and a web app, and it was necessary to be able to reach more women. And many of the demographics that came back to us reporting after using the web app told us that it was a mobile presence that might work well. So um, to cut a very long story short, I taught myself to code, and I coded Sahas. Um, the app is called Sahas, which means courage in Hindi, because it's our belief that if a survivor seeks to do anything to seek redress, whether it's to report or to get help or to just heal from a state of abuse or whatever situation she has been put in as a result of abuse, is an act of courage. It is an act of resistance. So um, Sahas actually saw the light of day in a soft launch in June this year, and between June as a mobile app. And between June until about September, we did a lot of testing with live actual users on ground on their phones. We also sorted out a couple of glitches, and today the app is available for different devices. Um, we've centralized access on one microsite. We've been able to help about 1,800 women so far since the app went live, and we've had about um, 1,500 downloads so far, so that's just the tip of the iceberg with the data. We've had some really interesting feedback as well, but I'm going to sort of step back a little and yield the floor back to Polly. Thank you. Oh. There I am. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, for sharing that. And I think that speaks to how often, um, you know, the work that we do comes from our personal place, either our personal experiences or things that we have um, seen among our friends and loved ones. And that can often be a really great motivator for, for our work. So thank you. Um, so next up we have, um, we will have Kalpana. Uh, Kalpana Viswantha is the co-founder of Safety Pin, a technology platform that works to build safer and inclusive public spaces in cities. 
Um, Safety Pin was started in 2013 and has spread to more than 20 cities in India and globally. She has um, also worked as a technical expert with UN Women and UN Habitat on issues of gender and urban safety. So our paths have crossed many times and we've actually co-presented together a few times. So good to see you again from, uh, from across the world. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you, Kali. Um, well, uh, Safety Pin has its uh, sort of genesis in um, work that I've been doing around public space violence and sexual harassment over the past 10 years, uh, working in safe city programs in Delhi and other countries. So one of the tools that we've been using is some, something called the safety audit, which is a methodology of assessing public spaces through people's experience about what makes it safe and unsafe. So what we did in 2013 was actually take this tool, which is really a paper and pen tool, but had been used in many places, we converted it to an app, and we did this for two reasons. One was it would then be available to any user around the world. And secondly, we wanted to try and um, do some work around quantifying a safety score, uh, really rather than keeping it as a qualitative tool, but to be able to give a number on what is the level of safety based on the data that we were crowdsourcing from uh, people around the world. We launched it. It has always been really to uh, be a kind of an information space for women as well as uh, urban stakeholders such as local governments and the police as a space where you can come to to find information and take safer decisions as well as try and improve public spaces. In these uh, four years, um, we've actually, well, we began in Delhi and spread to many cities in India We've also spread uh, globally, and we have now the app both in English and Spanish, as well as in Hindi. And we have about over 80,000 downloads in these past few years. And uh, it's been used really uh, very far and wide. And we, uh, every day we get in data from women around the world. Uh, in addition to working with individual women who can use this as a tool, recognizing the point that Holly made right up front that not all women have access to this technology and also they may not be able to use it at the moment when they are unsafe. We also work with local governments. We work with the police and urban planners to use this data to, um, in fact, in impact and make changes in cities. So the idea is really not to say this place is unsafe or that place is safe, but to really work with local communities, local neighborhood associations, women's groups, as well as city authorities to say, how do we make this place better? So, you know, the idea is really um, to reaching, reaching out to a larger number of women, reaching out to a larger number of stakeholders so that women's safety gets on the agenda of people who are able to actually uh, address how cities are designed, how cities are used, how cities are planned, and where resources go into in city planning. In, in, a, in a time when we know that more than 50% of the globe has become global, has become urban, and we have the new urban agenda, uh, it is important to get women's voices um, into that debate, into the, what they want, what kind of city they want. So really Safety Pin sees itself as a space that women can talk about what they find about public spaces that makes them feel safe, and because women do use public spaces, but what is it about certain kinds of spaces where they don't feel safe uh, and they can also report incidents, they can report experiences that they've had, and then they can report problems that they have in public spaces. Thanks, Kami. Thank you. I think that's what's um, so important about um, a lot of the apps today compared to even when I was doing research a few years ago is that it's not it's there's multi levels to um, to the process where you know you can get some immediate uh, feelings of help and um, just feel like you're doing something by reporting but then what you're reporting is actually being used in a broader way and your report can actually help a lot of different people because it's collective and um, is taken to, to stakeholders and to decision makers so that's a really important aspect of, of many of the apps. 
Um, all right, so next we will hear from um, Sierra. So Sierra is a social, uh, sorry, Sierra Blum, and she's a social entrepreneur and founder of Sierra, a digital advocate in the fight against sexual assault. As a student activist at the University of Denver, Sierra recognized the need for a tool that could serve to both educate and help the community following an assault. So in October, she took her app to the Clinton Global Initiative University, where Sierra, the app, was featured during a working session on addressing campus sexual assault. So I'm excited to hear more about this. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so as a student at the University of Denver, my first year, there were 15 cases of reported sexual assault. So when we look at the statistic on one in five women will be affected by sexual assault um, during their college years, us seeing 15 reports come out from our campus safety throughout the year was sh so shocking. And it really made me and some of my other um, fellow student activists really start thinking on what can we do to really change the narrative and change the way in which our campus, it, our campus is talking about sexual assault. And so me and uh, my friend Olivia, we kind of set out on doing research and talking to as many students as we could. And me being a business information and analytics major, I have an insane passion for technology, but I always viewed addressing sexual assault on campus as um, a more community organizing stance. So I looked at it as being something that technology couldn't really influence with a lot of, you know, great insight, but I quickly found that it was the opposite, which is why I created Sierra. Um, I, in talking to students, a lot of them didn't have someone that they could go to, to say, this is what happened to me. Who do I call? What do I do? A lot of them thought that the best way to do it was to either go to their friend and hope that their friend had some insight, or if that one friend didn't have anything, then oftentimes they would just be silent. And I thought, this is terrible because everyone should have someone that can help them assess their situation and then figure out the best plan of action in order to reach out to campus resources, knowing who were confidential versus mandatory reporters, which on U.S. college campuses, um, mandatory reporters are any um, paid professional or any paid employee of the university, um, except for a couple people. So for students to go to, you know, a professor who may be a mentor, that professor may have, may have the obligation to report it. But going back to the research that my friend Olivia and I did, um, really focused on what are students wanting and how can we have a conversation that's really um, impactful, but also get straight to the point. And so after all these conversations, I started developing my app, which is three question sets for survivors, secondary survivors, and third parties. And all of the question sets ask about safety and ask about um, you know, if they are wanting to report and the timing of the event, um, and then also assesses their mental state to really figure out what camp, what campus resources and then community resources are the most important for them to access within, in my mind, you know, that they would reach out within 24 hours. So it creates a plan of action for them so that they know exactly what to do, who to call without feeling this confusion. And then we also, um, a lot of, the people who took the question sets and were early users and kind of helped me understand, you know, are these good questions to be asking? Are they not? They also said that there should be an education piece to it so that students can understand why the questions are being asked and why it's important for a survivor to know that this is a question. So we actually ended up making it so that for a secondary survivor in third party, um, there's a five minute crash course. So they learn about how to support a survivor, how to create a safe space that has understanding and empathy. Um, and then it also, you know, also it, we're still finishing it and we, I am actually changing the ending of it, but um, it teaches it so that hopefully college campuses can start to use this as an education base for first year students so that they understand the issue of sexual assault 
and then how to create a campus that doesn't have blaming or, um, you know, asking questions like what was she wearing or was she drunk? And it teaches students that those questions are not acceptable. So from what I've built and for the various um, outreach that I did, I was able to go to the Clinton Global Initiative University. And I was able to talk to a lot of different people about what my app is doing. And um, it was featured. There were two out of, I think, quite a few projects that were um, used as a base for the session as um, some really great technologies that uh, campus students are using to help their communities. So that's it in a nutshell, but yeah. Thank you so much. That sounds like a really, really important resource and um, actually speaks a lot to me. When I was a college student, oh my gosh, it was in 2003, <laughs> um, I noticed that there weren't resources for, for um, survivors of sexual assault on my campus, not even like in the health center or campus safety, counseling center, nowhere. Um, so I ended up surveying my uh, student body and then making suggestions like putting flyers up in all of those places and all the bathrooms and magnets but um, that was pre-technology and I think that you know obviously you've taken it like a, a several steps further and I love that there's also that educational component for um, the secondary uh, survivors and the third party people as well as the specific tools to help the survivors um, that sounds um, like it can be really comprehensive and helpful congratulations too thank you well okay I'll ask a follow-up question after we hear from Elsa um, so Elsa is our last panelist. Elsa De Silva is the founder of Safe City, which is a platform that crowdsources personal experiences of sexual violence and abuse in public spaces. Since Safe City started in December 2012, it has become the largest crowd map on the issue in India, Kenya, Cameroon, and Nepal. Um, previously, Elsa worked for nearly tw 20 years in the field of aviation. Um, she's been part of many different fellowships. Um, including the Aspen Institute New Voices uh, Fellowship, which is where, uh, well, we met because of our street harassment activism, but also we've been able to work closely together the last few years because I also work for Aspen Institute as a consultant. So thanks for um, inviting me and for organizing this, Elsa. So over to you. Thank you, Holly. So I uh, heard about Harass Map in 2012, and it was a period in my life where I was wondering what was next in my career. I was looking for my purpose and I knew that uh, I wanted to do something more than the corporate world. And I didn't think, uh, I thought Harass Map was actually a very interesting uh, uh, project, but I did not really see um, the urgency to launch something like that in India till a horrific gang rape took place in December 2012, where a young woman uh, lost her life. And there was so much of outrage. And in my opinion, uh, the first time that I heard all these stories about sexual violence being discussed openly in the public space. And I was hearing uh, from my friends when they spoke about their own incidents, I was reminded of my own incidents as well, which I had kind of forgotten, uh, you know, subconsciously suppressing them over the years. And that's that got me thinking more deeply about the issue. And I decided, well, we need to bring this uh, to light, make it more visible, give women a chance to talk about their stories anonymously if they so choose to. But every story thus becomes a data point. And since I was, uh, you know, very much into analytics uh, on the business side of things in the aviation industry I didn't consciously realize it then but I realized I was doing something similar where I was using historical perspectives or stories to kind of uh, understand patterns and trends which could be used for future predictions and that's really what safe city is it uh, encourages people to anonymously share their stories of sexual violence in public spaces these are then converted into patterns and trends visualized on a map as hotspots and then you can use this information because it's available in the public domain at an individual level to improve your situational awareness and make better choices for your safety or you can mobilize your community to do something about it because you have access to this data which otherwise in countries like mine you don't and hold institutional service providers like the police and municipal authorities accountable in doing a better job uh, 
you know, with the authorities themselves, they have access to a new data set, which otherwise they would not have, uh, knowing full well that women and girls don't necessarily go to them. So why don't they go to them? It's because of this whole fear of bringing shame to themselves and their families, fear of dealing with the police who are perceived to be insensitive, as well as the lengthy judicial process for justice. And since I've started doing this work, what I've also realized is that there's total lack of awareness on the entire spectrum of abuse. Often they think of uh, sexual assault as only rape, you know, which is on one end of the spectrum, whilst on a daily basis, they ignore the verbal and nonverbal forms of it, even if it's, uh, you know, extremely debilitating to many, because uh, we've normalized it. And Holly talks about it in her work, in her books on stop street harassment. Um, so, yes, so we started off in India, but then I very quickly had uh, several partners reach out through my Vital Voices network. And they said, could we use your platform in our country? So before I knew it, you know, people were crowd mapping in Kenya, Nepal, Cameroon and other countries. What I found is that actually data can be very powerful. It highlights and makes visible the problem as well as uh, gives people access. You see, when a woman shares her story, that's, that to me is the first step in seeking help. And when someone else reads uh, this story, you're immediately, uh, you know, you immediately kind of know that you're not alone because you could have experienced something similar. It is also, you know, you come forward and break your silence because of the solidarity. This whole Me Too campaign on social media is, uh, you know, validates this where everyone's coming forward now that they feel they you know, they have uh, security in numbers, so to speak. Where they can where they can share their story, uh, but then you can by highlighting these stories, you actually raise the magnitude of the issue. And what every one of us is trying to do is address one part of the problem. But I think these apps are so complementary because, you know, each location has certain characteristics that make it the comfort zone of the perpetrator. By understanding it you can actually either help improve the safety or make better choices for yourself. So what we do is, you know, learn from each other. On a daily basis, we use peer review sites like TripAdvisor or Yelp to make decisions. So why can't we, um, you know, share our personal information in regard to this issue and learn from each other? Maybe somebody has handled it better. Maybe, you know, by collectively sharing what's going on in one particular location, we would be better prepared and, uh, you know, either stand up for, for ourselves or react faster or uh, have the right way to uh, respond to it. Whether your pepper spray is ready, your SOS app is fully loaded or, um, you know, you go with somebody. Uh, I believe public spaces should be safe for everyone, especially women and girls, because it's critical uh, as a first step to help women and girls achieve their potential. So I can go on and on and on, but I think, you know, Holly, you should ask us more questions and dive, uh, dive deeper into, you know, what our apps do, because I believe they're all very complementary. Yeah, thank you, Elsa. And I think you've done a, um, a really great job for, with your app of taking sort of the, the um, of applying the same concept in different um, mediums. So you go from sort of the online map to now also the phone app. Um, but yeah, let's, I'll ask a few more questions and we'll get some more info. Um, I actually wanted to start with Sierra since she's sort of still in the midst of finalizing her app. Um, Sierra, do you mind just saying a little bit more about what that process currently is like? Like how, where are you exactly in the process? And you know, how tough is this process? What, is it, what does it look like? to get from the idea to the end product? Yeah, um, I think being a young, a young woman who's still in college, I think has um, been both one of the best advantages and also a disadvantage. Um, currently, I have the question sets done and I just identified my developer or finalized it. I actually met him at CGIU, which was super awesome. Um, 
And the education piece kind of started to shift because I met a lot of students and fellow activists at CGIU who brought up some good points on what they thought, you know, the education should look like. And um, when they got to see one of the prototypes that has, um, that had the various elements included, they said, oh, what about this or what about this? And I started to realize I was so focused on my campus and the education that we receive at the University of Denver that trying to create a universal tool is going to have to change a little bit based on what other campuses are doing. So that is where the app currently is, um, where we are finishing it up. So it should be launching. Um, at DU in at least a clinical study be, rather than a beta testing um, in January or February. So I'm super excited because this is like the final uh, <laughs> stretch, I guess you could say. Um, but it's been pretty hard uh, because as I was saying in the beginning is that being a college student, it's in it's a great advantage because you have all of these resources at your fingertips and you have these networks like CGIU and um, various community groups, especially in the Denver area. I was able to tap into some really awesome mentorships that helped me understand the various elements on being a social entrepreneur and really helped me um, gain the confidence to say, yes, I'm going to do this and dive headfirst into the technology world. Um, but at the same time, it was a disadvantage because of the topic in which my app addresses. And in terms of seeking out funding and in terms of seeking out developers, those two things are, you know, kind of what you need in order to have a business. You need funding in order to pay your developer and or you need a developer in order to get funding because you have to have um, a product to show people. And a lot of the investors that I talked to said, this is such a fantastic idea. This is so needed, especially at DU, but you know, every campus, everywhere needs this. Um, and because it's so important, it's addressing a topic that is flooding the news since, you know, for most of the year, the news cycles have been addressing this topic to some degree. Um, they said people should be donating their time. Don't worry about it. And I started to say, well, no, I mean, I need funding because the developers that I really wanted to work with, um, you know, all had a pretty big fee or, um, you know, the the funding that I did get, they put stipulations on, we can cover um, your legal fees once you start seeking out, you know, wanting to build your company. So we'll pay for all of that stuff. So it, it was stipulated in what the person knew about versus saying, here's this open-ended funding. So that made it really hard because it created a little bit of a roadblock for me in terms of creating the app and actually being able to grow it and scale it and start being the entrepreneur that I really wanted to be. So it really took CGIU to open the doors and, and allow me to see how other universities wanted to adopt it as well as, um, you know, developers who were passionate about helping me. But ultimately I did get someone who said, I really want to help you with this versus saying, here's my price tag. So that was a little bit of the, that was the hardest part. So, um, all in all, I would say that that's probably one of the biggest lessons I've learned as a young entrepreneur is that you can get a lot of really great experience in doing this, but at the same time, you kind of have to prove your ability to do it before they act, before some people will actually let you do it. Hmm. That sounds like a, a, a lot of challenges that you face, but it sounds like you're, you, like you said, you're getting into that home stretch and that's really exciting. And I think the challenge about funding sexual violence work is something we can all relate to. It is, it's really, really hard, even when it is in the news. Um, I think the attitude is like what you found, oh, people will just donate their time or they just, a lot of people don't see the value and the work that um, people addressing this issue do. They think it's a volunteer type of activity instead of like bills need to be paid, people need to be paid to do good work. Um, but I'm so glad um, that it's so far working out and I look forward to seeing that app go live. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Kirithi, can you talk about an example of the kind of impact your app has had? Sure. Um, first of all, I just like to sort of uh, respond to something Sarah said. 
Um, I completely agree because being in this space and not receiving funding and then being greeted by developers who show you that price tag for us would be incredibly challenging. Um, I've been there, I've seen it, hats off for grading it, and I'm so grateful to know that your app is on its way to come through. Um, in terms of the kind of impact we've seen, so somewhere in the process of actually gathering data of verifying organizations that are providing services, because we don't list any organization that offers services unless we verify that they do, we're very conscious to make sure to check in every couple of months. Somewhere down the process, we had a bit of a, um, a crisis of faith, wondering if we were really doing enough, if this really made sense. Um, and we had an email in the inbox at that time, which told us the story of a young woman who was in Sri Lanka, whose sister had gotten married and uh, settled in Germany. Now, this young woman in Sri Lanka was due to leave to use it and to study, and she was on her way um, when she started noticing that her sister was behaving a little differently. She wouldn't come on video conferencing, she wouldn't talk to her family anymore. Um, any phone calls were monosyllabic, and um, she often seemed very withdrawn and low. So on one of the calls, this young woman asked her sister if she could just respond with a yes or no, and asked her a couple of questions that seemed to her to give away the fact that her sister was probably in an abusive marriage. So using the map, which was at that point still a web-based app, she managed to trace an organization in Germany. Um, I'm not going to go into which city it was for the, sake of, <clears throat> for the sake of privacy. But she managed to trace this organization and spoke with a social worker in the organization and told her that this was something she suspected was happening to her sister. Her sister was not a citizen, although her sister's husband was a citizen. So she asked them if they could investigate. So the social worker um, took the case on, decided to just pay the, visit, pay the household a visit based on the tip-off she received. And it turned out that the girl was being tortured, was being abused, and at one point was even tied to the railings of the flight of stairs inside her house. Um, she was not allowed to make phone calls. Um, if she did get on a phone call with people in her family, it was entirely done with her husband hovering around. So there was no one that she could turn to. Eventually, she was rescued, she's out of danger, she's relocated to a different country, and she's in a safe space. But that one act for a woman on her way from Sri Lanka to New Zealand to be able to use the app to find a resource in Germany, to contact that resource, and for that resource to respond and rescue a woman in need was the biggest validation we needed. Um, and, and that crisis of faith just about vanished. Um, since then, we've had some amazing stories of rescue, some amazing stories of bystander intervention using the tools that help bystanders understand what they're supposed to do. So it's been a great learning experience as well alongside. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I, I think that's probably a motivation for so many of us in our work when you actually see these, these uh, incredible impacts, you know that people's lives are being literally saved. Um, or at least improved, and you see the education, um, you know, happening with with the bystanders and and um, their loved ones. Um, so that's that's really great. Congratulations um, on being able to see that impact and being able to to really help people in their lives in concrete ways. Um, Kalpana, I wanted to ask you um, if you want to expand a little bit on why you think it was important to create an app sort of supplement or um, build on the work that you had been doing for so many years already. And if you want to talk about a specific impact within that answer too, that's fine as well. Um, you're, you're still on mute. Hi, is this okay? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, no, I was saying it was so nice to hear both uh, Sierra and Kirti and to see young women coming up with innovative solutions to problems uh, for older feminists like us. It's a very, it's very heartening and positive to see that. Uh, well, you know, for, um, I think some of the most interesting successes for us have been where uh, governments have actually used the data. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of very interesting success, successes. One is um, based on the data that we collected, we had collected about almost, uh, we'd mapped about 40,000 points in the city of Delhi based on the crowdsourced data as well as other data that we analyze. And 
when we shared it with the government, we shared that there was actually over 7,000 uh, completely dark spaces in the city, which women found difficult to access. Uh, and when uh, in this data we shared early this year, and they've actually worked on the database that we gave them. And uh, recently they asked us to, if we would do a remapping of the city, both through a, a, a methodology of photography analysis, as well as getting crowdsourced data to see which, um, whether there's been an improvement in safety based on the response by the local government. Now, this is a huge success for us because one is it got the government to respond and that is very important to us. And secondly, uh, we can actually see change because really, as I said in the beginning, our aim is not to say, oh, this place is unsafe and that place is safe. Our aim is to say, this place is unsafe because of this, this, and this. And if you fix this, this can also become a safer space. So the idea is really to improve the access of women and people so that they can use their city and public spaces in a way that empowers them and that gives them an equal right as a citizen. Because I really believe that the lack of safety hinders a woman's right to equal citizenship in a city because she takes decisions that she shouldn't go out here, she shouldn't study this, she shouldn't work there, she shouldn't go for tuition class, whatever it is, it is actually impinging on her right as a citizen. The second interesting um, uh, impact that we've had was actually very far away in a city in Bogota, where the local government again used our methodology of collecting data, but they wanted to actually map the entire bicycle route of the city in order to find ways of making biking safer for women because you know it's uh, using bicycles in cities gives you mobility gives you access gives you independence and while bogota spent a lot of money on building the infrastructure they hadn't yet addressed the issue that how do we get more women to use it because the, it is the lack of safety which prevents women from biking at night especially after dark so that data was used to determine where uh, lights should be put, where CCTV camera, cameras should be put, where the parking of bicycles should be kept, where bicycle sharing uh, points should be kept. So really, in a way, I think for us, these two examples represent ways that we've expanded the usage of public space for women directly through the data that has been captured in the app. And I I think that is the kind of change that we are looking for, that, you know, that spaces become more accessible, more inclusive and accessed by women equally so that they don't feel that they cannot do something because of this, this feeling that, oh, I will not be safe. So maybe I can talk about, uh, you know, the impact of our work at Safe City. So what started off as a web app, uh, you know, and me trying out something that I thought was going to work then went into a whole process where we started working with communities and partner NGOs in uh, several parts of India and as I said other countries where they would get women in their communities to talk about their stories we would analyze the data both qual quantitatively and qualitatively find the insights invite um, you know, relevant stakeholders, whether it was the police, the municipal authorities, or even, um, you know, religious in the community. And then we would facilitate a discussion on what did the community want as a solution. And I think it's been an amazing experience where, uh, you know, we've had a range of solutions. So right from having the police change their beat patrol timings with just 20 data points in a six month period in Bombay to, you know, the police in Delhi changing their beat patrols after they were invited to a community meeting of 200 people. They first denied that there were any um, incidents of sexual violence in that neighborhood. But when they were presented with 200 reports from our site, they immediately had to retract their statement and uh, increase their vigilance. We've had municipal authorities fix uh, street lighting, both in Mumbai and Delhi, and in Delhi in particular, where public toilets seem to be a hotspot in low-income communities. They have uh, made 
those safe. They've been maintaining them, cleaning them up, uh, fixing the infrastructure, uh, like lighting doors and windows. We've also had very interesting uh, solutions come out from the community. So one of them uh, I quote very often is on a main road in Delhi where the, the hotspot was near a tea stall, which is generally a male dominated space. Men would loiter there, intimidate women and girls who were passing by with their commenting. And we organized an art workshop with the Fearless Collective and the girls and women painted staring eyes and subtle messaging on the walls, uh, which translate loosely into English uh, to look with your heart, not with your eyes. We won't be intimidated by your gaze. And that had such a positive impact on the community that they actually uh, stopped their staring and loitering. And the community uh, stood in solidarity with the girls. We replicated that in Bombay outside a girls' college. Uh, they added sections of the law in addition to, you know, um, reflecting their feelings on the wall. We had several men stop and thank us for uh, creating awareness on the sections of the law because they did not know it was a crime. And that again was replicated in Delhi outside a public toilet. It had an immediate effect where the young men who were indulging in sexual harassment actually joined the campaign and started advocating for their peers. We also have um, another example from Kibera where in, um, you know, one of the hotspots was near a mosque and my partner organization invited the imam and uh, showed him the data and he started, uh, you know, including the messaging in his sermons. And that was, uh, uh, you know, enough to get the message across to the young men. So I think these stories are very powerful. They... Um, you know, kind of communicate in ways that individual voices cannot about what's going on in that localized community. And it's up to the community then to take, uh, uh, you know, steps for change. But we also work directly with the police in Bombay, Delhi and Goa. And uh, it came about because the police at one of the conferences that I attended said that they were scanning our website for trends, knowing full well that women and girls don't go to them. Um, since then, you know, the Delhi police, uh, they invited us to partner with them in Northwest Delhi on the Parivartan program where they do the self-defense and we do the gender sensitivity. We also have a special uh, partnership with the Goa police and they have responded to people uh, because people can write directly to them through our, uh, you know, website. And we continue to receive requests uh, from different other uh, you know, institutional bodies. But I also want to make a point about the funding from the previous question to Sierra, because, uh, you know, the funding for our mobile application, which is an extension of the Safe City reporting platform, was actually through GES last year in San Francisco. I met a person, a private donor, and I didn't know he was a donor. I was just talking to him about my work, and he found the relevance and the need for it. And he asked me, why didn't we have a mobile app? And I said, well, I don't have the funding for it. And he asked me how much I needed, and he actually gave me the money. So it was very timely and fortunate. There are people in this world who also uh, want to be part of the movement. And we found that uh, having data can also include a lot of men and boys in the solution because they respond to it in a very positive way. So yeah, so uh, over to you, Holly. I hope your mic issues are sorted out. I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I don't know what happened, but I logged in and all the same and it seems to work again. Um, Great. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, obviously we've been talking quite a bit about women in particular um, because women are the ones who are disproportionately affected by these issues and, um, you know, have our, our citizenship, um, our, our ability to fully participate as citizens, as um, Kalpana was talking about, sort of curtailed. But men are, given the gender pay gap and all these other barriers, men often do have more money than we do. <laughs> and so they can be a good resource for funding and for being allies. And like you said, there are um, often men who want to be involved. Um, I know my my own father is uh, the biggest donor Stop Street Harassment has. Um, he uh, donates every month to help our national hotline on street harassment um, uh, continue, and he often will solicit his his colleagues um, who then donate and tend to be our bigger donors because they have the money to give. 
Um, so I think it is important to tap into those resources and know that there are often men who want to be involved and they're not sure how. Um, and sometimes that financial contribution seems pretty simple to them, but it makes a huge difference for us. Um, Renita, do you have, uh, have any questions come in from our audience? No, they haven't, no, they haven't been any questions. Okay. Well, if anyone is, is um, watching and has a question, please let me know. Um, otherwise, I don't know if any of our panelists have any questions for each other. Um, we have a couple minutes left or anything else, like a, a last thought that people would want to share, kind of open it up if anyone wants to chime in. Say something. Hi, Holly, this is Kalpana. Yeah. You know, I think um, uh, it's uh, listening to my co-panelists and, you know, what I'm finding very um, interesting is that uh, the way that we are now able to, I think, use online, offline, uh, linking up with the with authorities and how people are beginning to take this issue so much more seriously. You know, mm -hmm. I think the Me Too campaign last month was just a validation of the work that we all do. That this is a huge problem, and I think uncovering the 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 extent of this problem is something we're just beginning to touch the iceberg, you know. I mean, like you said, there's been a lot of work from the women's movement about domestic violence and intimate partner violence. But really, this everydayness and the normalization of sexual harassment is something, I think it's the next really big issue that the women's movement and is, is, is it's facing us right now. And I see that with all these kind of inputs from different people, uh, I think um, we are ready to face it. You know, there's the the, the the more traditional methods of dealing with it, but there are also more innovative and uh, and interesting methods of of dealing with it. Reaching the unreached, you know, I think technology sometimes. While you said in the beginning that some women don't have access, I think the other side of it is that sometimes women, it is only because of technology they're able to get the information and reach it like this um, example, you know, and I, th I think there are both sides to it. And I do think that from the time you did your research in 2014, I think the access of women to technology is constantly growing because yeah. the technology is growing. Smartphones are becoming cheaper. And I think that is something we're seeing everywhere. You know, I mean, Elsa will agree to that. Even when you go to a low-income neighborhood in India nowadays, you will see the young people walking around with smartphones. So I do believe that there's a great potential in the work that we're all doing. And I'm, I think this is a great way of, you know, linking up and learning from each other. And I really look forward to working together with all of the people who are on this panel today. Yes, and to take on from what Kalpana said, you know, I think these stories are very important because we don't talk often enough about it. And we feel very alone when we are experiencing it because of the shame associated with it by exposing it in many ways, whether it is auditing an area through safety pin, whether it is, uh, you know, highlighting all the resources that are there or sharing your story, um, you know, on safe city. I think uh, we can make people think more deeply about it. But also over a period of time, I think we have to get the taboo out of it. It's only when uh, women feel comfortable uh, will we really be ab able to address all of it. If you, if you notice on the Me Too campaign as well, lots of women put Me Too, just the hashtag, and never mention their story. That to me indicates there's still a lot of work that's left to be done because they're still not ready to share their story. And these are women who have access to uh, mobile phones, technology, and resources. And, you know, I mean, if they can't be empowered, can you imagine how much, how many more women out there, you know, who don't have access to these resources feel very alone? So maybe together we can make this uh, problem, you know, a lot more visible, a lot more, uh, build a lot more solidarity into the movement and, uh, you know, uh, take a stand that it's time that we don't have to face this anymore. I agree. I agree. Um, if I could, yeah, yeah, if I could just jump in and add to what Elsa was saying and also what Kalpana was saying. Um, it's beautifully true that all the work that we're doing is heavily complementary. And um, something I want to share right now would allude to that because 
Elsa talked about how a lot of women just shared the hashtag without going into their stories. Um, personally, having been one of those people who actually did, did say me too, you know, long before me too as a hashtag without telling my story, I can identify with the kind of trauma that's associated with coming out of the story. I'm a survivor of rape, of sexual abuse for 13 years of my life, and coming out with that story was the toughest thing for me to do. Sometimes I wouldn't have the words, and even now there are times when I just withdraw into a shell. So um, I feel that in those kind of instances, an app like Sahas or an app like what Sierra is creating can then help a survivor come to a place where owning her narrative is then possible and then add to the already existing cache of stories in both your apps. So I think it's a bit of a journey. I, I wouldn't say that it's just apps and a milestone, you know, different milestones. I think it's just the entire journey in itself. You choose where you want to start. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for sharing your story too. Sierra, did you have any last thought um, before we close? Yeah, I was just gonna say, from a college perspective, um, and also talking about you know me too and the whole conversation just now, um, I have to say that seeing a lot of my peers say hashtag me too, but a lot of them didn't share their story. I think that the work that is being done, you know, we're definitely just scratching the surface on how deep it goes because unfortunately for how many women experience this as, you know, young children all the way up until, you know, way past college. And even though my focus is on where I am in my current life, I think that I was very shocked at seeing how many individuals, you know, said hashtag me too, but didn't share their stories. And it just, you know, really gives the importance of us needing to tackle this because, you know, we have to start changing the conversation and encouraging survivors to own it because to own their stories and to feel like they can have the safe space to do so because, um, you know, we can only really create change when we no longer have the stigmas associated with judgment and that blame will be put on the people who have experienced this because it's never anyone's fault. So I just wanted to contribute to the Me Too conversation because I think it's so important that, you know, we keep the conversation going on this since it did become so big so fast. Yeah, thank you. And I think the great thing about Me Too is that it is continuing in a lot of ways. And I feel like for the first time we are seeing, at least so far in the U.S. context, we're seeing a lot of men being held accountable and losing their jobs and losing their positions. And I think that's the shift that we need to see is, the accountability, because I think, that, you know, if, if a, um, a survivor of sexual harassment and abuse doesn't feel comfortable speaking out, part of it may be because they don't know what, like, what's going to be the outcome. Um, you know, I'm sharing this, and then so what? This person stays in power, this person still is in the community, and so forth. So I think that once we see the shift, I, I feel like a lot more people are going to feel comfortable speaking out and knowing that their story is going to make a difference. Um, and that it's great to have many mediums for them to, to share their stories through, including through the apps that you all are, are, have developed and are developing. So with that, um, thank you so much to all of you for your time and for the important, really important work you're doing. Um, it, it, despite barriers of you know, funding and probably time and you're juggling so many projects, um, but do you know that your, your work is appreciated and clearly it's being used um, or will be used and um, and, and I really appreciate the work that you all are doing. So I guess we'll close there. Thank you. Thank you.